I've got something very special for you today, which is an interview between me and another perfect scoring GRE tutor. I don't normally do interviews on this channel. In fact, it's the first one I've ever done. So you have to forgive any slight quality issues with the microphone. Essentially, I just recorded a Zoom call. But we talk about everything from the best tips to get a 340, the best study schedule, the best resources to use. And we agree 90% of the time, but not all the time. The guy is called Saad Amir. He's a great guy. And I've put the link in the description to some of the things we talk about and his social media channels. So without further ado, here is the interview. And it kicks off with me being so impressed by the number of students that he works with every year. I had eight A stars and five A's in my O levels and top in the world distinction in economics in my no. O levels. Wow. <laughs> and I've been through the same system, the Cambridge system. Yeah. And then in A levels, I had economics, business, his, uh, for five subjects, and I had uh, three A stars and two A's. That's amazing. That's amazing. Bro, that's you know, that's better like, results than me, but I'm not going to disclose <laughs> what I got. I'm not going to disclose what I got. <laughs> my, well, school honestly, days, Philip, my school yeah, days were honestly, quite tough. Go on. Uh, uh, yeah, to be honest, Philip, these exams, these standardized exams, I think are much more tougher. I'll tell you the reason why. Because in OA levels, you always have access to past papers, right? Yes. But in these standardized exams, there is no access to past papers. What the, the most authentic sources, official guide, and that is nothing. Like the number yeah. of questions are very less. So we're, yeah, we were going to talk about that in a second, but you're so right that the official guide is so thin. And then the only other resource, well, there's a few other resources. I know your students, I think, are interested in what resources I recommend. But obviously the Manhattan Five Pound Guide, it's not the freshest, but the volume of questions is really good. And I used to say to students, that, oh, it's a little bit harder than the real thing. You know, Manhattan, five pound is really good. But it's a little bit harder than the real thing. I don't say that anymore because I think the level of the real thing has gotten slightly harder. And some students ask me that. And I know you're going to ask, like, has it got harder? And that's what everyone wants to know. And I get it in the comments all the time. I think that the questions have gotten a little bit wordier. Like they word the questions in a slightly more complicated way. The actual maths might be easier, but they're trying to catch out those students who've just stuffed themselves in the last two weeks full of formulas. You know, they've memorized formula sheets. They may have watched like five videos and then they're like, I'm ready to go. And so when they make a wordy question, those students are kind of like, oh, I don't know what to do. And so it rewards those students who've done lots of practice tests, put the time in, really thought about the concepts, analyze their mistakes. It rewards those kind of students and not the students who jam in for like two weeks. I don't know what you think. That, that's a very, very good insight because in my experience, I've also seen that people who have invested in terms of time right now on the real GRE are saying it, but people who are just stuffing it at the end, like practicing like crazy and not going through the rigorous process, uh, their scores aren't bumping by much. Another yeah. thing, I 100% agree with you that the real GRE can't now is tricky in the sense that it is more wordier and also I'll give you another example because a lot of students take the test that for example if you have a ge geometry question they will not draw the figure for you now now you have to draw the figure mm. yourself mm. it's so much wordier and, and it consumes so much time on the exam that the student uh, this, and, and in the mocks that's not the case because the mm. mocks are pretty old mm. uh, only the I know some students might say that the power play plus three is a little recent Mm. But I would still say that the real GRE con is getting trickier and there is no substitute to it. And you write the Manhattan 5LB is a good book. Um, what I've noticed about the Manhattan 5LB, and I've also made a video on it on my channel, is that firstly, people use it for verbal, which is which shouldn't be the case because it concentrates on a lot yes. of difficult vocabulary. I know what you're gonna say, I know you're gonna say you're gonna say it's all about the super hard words. Whereas in yeah. the real test, it's about contextualized sentences. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, my Exactly. And also on the con section, yeah, um, it's decent, but it concentrates more on long working, like doing long working. But on the real GRE, it's either you know the question or you don't. It's in a spread mm -hmm. of a second. Yeah. So Manhattan, yeah, uh, it is a good resource, you know, practice topically, especially. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's good for getting volume in if a student really wants to practice. The one question I've, I've got to you, though, is that I know a lot of people always putting in my comments on YouTube, like, oh, it's getting harder, it's getting harder. Even though I've tutored far less students over the last year, like 80, I still want to talk about that, by the way. It's absolutely insane. <laughs> I just don't even understand. Like, we're, we're so different. I can only work with maybe about eight or 10 students in one go. Like, I've got about six students at the moment. You're, you're working probably with like 100 right now, as I speak. Yeah, right now it's, it's 92. I don't even know how you keep track of that. I, I wouldn't even remember their names. Like, I'd be like, you, you, you. <laughs> um, but anyway, what was I going to say? The only thing question is, if it's getting so much harder, why is it that my students, when they score something in the Manhattan practice test and the Kaplan practice test and the ETS, those are the three I recommend, Manhattan, Kaplan, ETS. If I'm desperate, no offense to these companies, I love all these companies, but if I'm desperate, I might, say, okay, maybe do the free Magoosh test, maybe do the free Princeton test, you know, maybe the free Veritas, just to get some extra tests in there, but um, crunch prep maybe. But the ones, are not really the economists, to be honest, no offense economists, but they're, they're, they're not amazing. But the, the ones that I really recommend it, ETS, Manhattan, and Kaplan, why is it that they're scoring a certain mark in those and they're getting something not too different in the real test? Like if the real test had gotten so much harder, then you'd expect like, oh, they're getting 150s or 160s and then they're getting like 148 in the test. So I, I think it's gone harder, but maybe by like 15%, 20%, not 200%. I, I get what you're saying. You're saying that if I recommend uh, different resources to my students, there's not a huge difference in their scores, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a very good question. And Philip, log on to my channel on Instagram, which is GRE341 with Saad. I concentrate more on the real GRE than what is happening on the real GRE. I have manually, manually checked 5,000 diagnostic ETS reports and I have analyzed them. Oh my and gosh. Those, yeah, and that is, those are my insights. I would say that the quant is getting tougher, but the marking is a little lenient. I'll give you an example. Because ah, I've seen so many diagnostic yes, that makes reports. Sense. Yeah, I've seen so many diagnostic reports that I am 100% sure about this. For example, back in 2016, if you had scored a 15 out of 20 on your first section of font and a 15 out of 20 on your second section of font, I'm just giving it an example, you would have scored around 160 and 161 on the real GI. But if, if you score 15 and 15 right now, as of today, you are definitely going to score around the 164 mark. Mm, that makes sense. You've, you've actually put your finger on it. So then everyone's right. Everyone's right. We're yeah. right that the test is getting a bit harder, not crazy harder, yeah. but a bit harder. But then the marking's getting a bit more lenient, a little bit, which balances out to be fairly similar to the mark yeah. you're on other tests. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very interesting. And, and talking about the verbal section, that has not changed. Even the official guide's difficulty level is at the same level. Uh, one thing that people still ask me is how, how many words to learn. I think people who learn even 3,000, 2,000 words, that's, that's mm. like wasting time. I think Magush common and basic words are more than enough. If you have a lot of time on your hands, then you can go into the advanced section. But I would definitely, and I saw your podcast, uh, your video on the words also. That is very decent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can definitely look into that because I saw all those words and those are pretty decent. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I, I get this a lot on my vocab videos, which are weirdly my most popular videos. It's really interesting. But people ask me. I'll tell you why it? that is. I'll tell you why that is. Because your video is sort of a podcast for students. And so I recommend three to four different ways to learn vocab. First is rote learning, which everyone can do it, but finds it difficult. The second is to write it down and then learn it. But the, the disadvantage in that is that it consumes a lot of time. The mm. third is through pictures. But people don't have a photographic memory in that sense. But the fourth that your video is doing very mm. good is because it's like a podcast. So people yeah. plug in their earphones or their AirPods and then they listen to it. Yeah, wow. it, it. it shows you how much we think because I was literally yeah. about to say that pe people ask me on my comments, is this enough? Should I do another word list? What should I prioritize? And like you, I think vocab lists should be at the bottom of the priority list. How much higher being doing practice questions, getting better at reading. But I do think vocab lists play a part. And I think one of the reasons that they can be useful, as you just said, I think we're on the same page, is if someone's going on a long walk, 
or a run or they're, you know, they're, they're going to the gym or whatever they're doing where they don't need to concentrate, maybe doing housework, have it on in the background, you know, learning words and it's something they can do at the same time where you can't do maths like that. Um, you can't like be solving math problems while you're doing a run or it's much harder to. So it can be like a supplement. It's not the main meal, but it's like a supplement. And I do think I always advise my students also the same thing to learn vocab in your spare time and also like to concentrate more on okay. So another question that people ask me, the students ask me is that uh is vocab the game changer? Um, this is a very tricky question. Is vocab the game changer? I would say definitely if you don't know vocab, you won't be able to attempt sentence equivalence and text mm -hmm. completion. But it's not the game changer in the sense that if you learn 1100 words or 1500 words, you'll know every question on the GI. You no. need to understand what the, what the sentence is saying. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely do. I mean, obviously, it can be quite exciting when there's a question that you totally would have gotten wrong because you don't know the vocab and you would have no chance of getting it right. Even by knowing etymology, by knowing prefixes, suffixes, you still definitely get it wrong. And then when you learn the word, you'll definitely get it right because you know the word. That's exciting, but that's much less common. That will happen in the test, but much more common is needing the ability to, as you say, look at the context. What is the author trying to say? Because often ETS, and it's a much harder question to create, you know? I've seen how other people try to imitate these questions, but the way the ETS does it is they give you possible options which would sound right if you don't understand what the author's trying to say. But if you understand, oh, the author's trying to say it's got this positive, but it's also got this negative, by understanding that context, then you'll get it right. And it's not always about vocab. So vocab can be really exciting to learn and really fun. And also I would say, and this is maybe where we're different, I think is incredibly beneficial for life. Like my mum was an English teacher. And she would teach me. What, what yeah. is my mom is also an <laughs> and my dad was a, my dad was a math teacher. I, I don't know if that's a good no, your dad's not. Uh, so, but my mom was an English teacher, and she taught me vocab like on the way to school. And I do think um, people think, oh, it's just fancy words, just fancy words. But I have found over my life just the ability to use vocab confidently and understand what people are saying, even when they're talking about technical stuff. It is. It's good for life. I know we're moving away from the GRE, but I'm, I'm, I'm always going to believe in both. <laughs> and also, uh, what you're trying to basically come on to is the point that you need to know the vocab, vocab's contextual meaning. That is very important. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And also, because you, you're so right, right, because some, sometimes words can have multiple meanings. Exactly. And they might know, someone might know the main definition, but do you know the definition when it's in context? Yeah. I'm so impressed by the way, I must get must say, you got um you got a perfect score in the in the verbal, right? Uh, yeah, and this is this is very ironic in the sense because I'm an Asian. So Asians are expected to be better at con and uh -huh. not that good at verbal. But I have a perfect score on the verbal section and one less in the con section, and that is because I I missed out on a question also. As in I only had three seconds, I still remember it was a triangle question. <laughs> And I knew the answer, but I didn't have the time to click. Yeah, but that's so amazing. That's so much more impressive than, than my achievement because you, you're not, you weren't brought up, right, as a native yeah. English. I, my parents only spoke English. I only know English. Like I taught myself some Mandarin Chinese, but basically I only know English. And <laughs> this is your second language, right, at least. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're 170. You that's so impressive. In English, but our primary and secondary education has been in English, but like, it's not a primary language. Yeah, that's so, so impressive. Um, Thank you so it's much. It's a pity about that last question, but, but yeah. you know, you just shouldn't have regrets about the quant. Yeah. Um, yep. uh, and uh, there's another thing that people, do uh, you know what people want? People want a shortcut to this exam. Like we have uh, mm. two weeks. Can can we can we can you guarantee a score of three twenty plus? I never do that because that's like giving false hopes. You need exactly. to go through the process. Students need to understand this. Yeah, yeah. You must get this all the time. I always get a question from my student, which is understandable given that they're paying a lot of money. But okay, how long will it take me to get a three thirty? And that question is like it, it depends on so many things. It depends on what your current level is in both yeah. math and English. It depends on your exam confidence. Some people yeah. not nervous at all, they enjoy it. 
Um, they go into the exam. Other people like they get lower on the day because of their exam performance. It depends on are you working full time or are you a full time student or are you dedicating everything, every spare moment to the test? It depends how much tutoring you get. There's a lot of factors that go in there, but you probably get that question as well a lot, right? Like how long is it going to take me to get your score, like 339? <laughs> and Philip, I mean, I do understand where they're coming from. It's an innocent question from students, but yeah. as you said, every human's base level is different, Yeah. right? And yeah. their uh, grasping level and their attention is different. So I just gave a general uh, timeline that in two to three months, and if you study for two to three months for three hours per day, you can reach that level, but there is no, absolute no guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's interesting yeah. from... One of the, one of the questions I was going to I was going to ask you was about because this is one area I think I can improve on as a tutor. Like I think I'm an amazing tutor, but it's like I, I sometimes wonder about what homework to give students and what sort of timeline not not timeline a weekly schedule. You know, like how much to allocate them. And what I've settled on at the moment, but I'm, I'd love to hear your input. You've worked with more students, but if you've got a full time job you know, pick two or three evenings during the week where you haven't had the worst day. You know, if you had a terrible day, don't worry, just just, just relax. But like a couple of nights or three nights, do like an hour and a half to two hours in the evening. That only adds up to four or five hours. But on weekends, particularly in the mornings, try to do four or five hours and in really intense bursts, really build pattern recognition. And actually, by the way, I'm guessing one of your questions might be, what is my one of my top tips, you know, for students to improve. And that is one of my top tips. Just doing 20 minutes at a time, I don't think it's like enough for the brain to really absorb the pans. And so one of the things I recommend is, yeah, sit down Saturday morning or Sunday morning, do four hours. This is what I used to do. I used to get the books or a laptop in my bed, just do it, do it, do it, having fun, like really absorbing everything for four or five hours, sometimes longer. But that only adds up to, as you've noticed, 12, 13, 14 hours a week of what I'm giving them. Now you're saying three hours a day. So what, what schedule do you give your students? This is a very pertinent question. And I think I am in a, I'm in a good position to answer this because uh, your audience might not know, but I scored a 296 on my first attempt also. Wow. So, and that was 138 in verbal and 158 in font. So that is pretty bad. And then I started figuring out what the exam wants from me and my, so I, I, was working at British Council. So they operate O and A levels in Pakistan and the IELTS exam and stuff. And I gave the exam after like two to 2.5 months. And I used to work nine to five, then sleep from five to 11, and then study from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. on weekdays also, because you wow. have to be consistent. Yeah, so three hours there. And on the weekends, I used to do around four to five hours, what you're trying to do. But uh, 10 minute break after every two hours. Yeah, I mean, I do know the science that says, before a student like comments and says, oh, the science says take a 15 minute break every 45 minutes. Like I know the science, but like, yep. I don't know, maybe I should recommend that taking breaks, but obviously like short breaks to go up and get coffee is good. Caffeine is a known stimulant. You need water. I'm having water right now. It boosts exam scores by 10%. People don't know that. It's, it boosts oxygen to the brain. Walking around, again, boosts oxygen to the brain. So I, I don't mind like mini breaks. I'm talking like, yeah, five, 10 minutes. It's fine. I'm not, I'm not being ridiculous. Like you, you break your back if you, if you lay in bed for like five hours. But yeah, short mini breaks. But that's interesting about the weekday thing. Three hours every night. That that's dedication. That's real dedication. So you had a fight. You'd have a four-hour nap when you came back from work. Yeah, exactly. I had a four-hour nap. And then I you slept again for four hours at two at two a.m. Yeah, exactly. I slept around two thirty and then woke up around seven. Wow. Okay. I'm glad and you're getting your eight hours in because you do need that. Yeah, because otherwise it gets very unhealthy. And Philip, another thing, people will start studying. They'll say that we studied for eight hours, but Definitely ask them this question. Was your phone switched on? Because if your phone is switched on, then there is no point. Those eight hours are like two hours. So I always put my phone on airplane mode. That is, that, wow. that was very, yeah. That's because a great point. Dedicated. Yeah. Yeah, I should, yeah. That's a great point. And okay, here's a really interesting question. This is what I really want to know. What do you do when you get a student who comes back to you after a week 
and then they haven't followed your recommendations. So say you've laid out, because I lay out that 12 to 15 hour plan and you lay out what sounds like more like 15 to 20 hours. And then what if they come back and say, oh, it was a busy week. I had my phone. I got like three hours work done. What, what do you say? This is, so I, I face this a lot, but Philip, first I used to try to uh, give them a plan B or something, but that doesn't work out. So what I do is I say that this class, I am not going to take it. I, I, That's what I, I do. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to take it. You need to go through that process that I told you, your, the plan A, and then come back to me because, of course, we can. And if you tell them, yeah, I'll teach you right now, but it's going to be more, more or less repetition of plan A that you had to cover and your money is getting wasted. They definitely understand that this guy is serious and then they do it the next time. Because yeah. if you get them leeway, a lot of leeway, I would say that it is detrimental for them in the yeah. plan. No, you're absolutely right. And you're ahead of me because that's something I've been doing in the last six months, but I've been tutoring for like 10 years. So what, what I used to be is like, I never used to give up on people. I, I hate giving up on people. I never try to give up on people. I'm always like, you know, you yeah. can do this. I'm not, you know, I'm going to help you to work with this. If you have all the time in the world to work with one student, maybe that can work. But when you've got a lot of students, I have realized it took me too long to realize that what you're saying is right. Actually, you just have, and I've started to do that now, which is, okay, they, they message me for a session and I just say, well, have you done the work? Have you done the work that I said? And if they haven't, I say, well, come back to me when you've done the work. And you're right, it is better for them as well. Yeah, I know it's hard saying that as a tutor because I'm also very soft-hearted that way and I can see that you're also in the mm. same boat. But you have to put your foot down at some point in yeah. time because yeah. otherwise uh, they would be wasting money and yeah. it's difficult for them to score and then even we as tutors feel bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're 100% right. That is definitely, definitely the way. Yeah, any other questions that your, that your students wanted to know? Yeah, uh, my students definitely ask me um, how much importance should we give to the SA section, which is the AWA section? Ah, yes. Um, oh, that reminds me. And then we can also talk about a bit, a bit about the GMAT as well, because I get questions in the GMAT about the integrative reasoning. So this is what I tell my students, but I'm up for hearing your input. Like I say that it shouldn't be the priority in studying. You should put all your, you know, pretty much all your efforts into the quantum verbal. But given that it only takes about 30 minutes, 60 minutes to really brush up on some of the key skills you need for the essays. I've done two videos on this on my YouTube channel. I'm talking things like proofreading for grammar errors, syntax, throwing in some nice vocabulary, structuring the argument. That, like, why not? If it only takes 30 minutes, 60 minutes, why not just do that to boost your essay score from a four to a five or from a 3.5 to a 5.5? You know, it, it can work, so why not? And in terms of the impact of the actual score, my focus is, and we might have a slightly different student base, pretty much all of my students want to get into the top 100 business schools in the world. And, yeah. and almost all of them want to get into the top 20. I say to them that in my experience, it's very, very rarely the deciding factor. You know, people are going to look at the scores much more often. And even more than that, they're going to look at the application. How well written is the application? What profile have you got? What things have you done in your life? At the bottom of the list, if they have two students who are identical, maybe they'll look at the essay, maybe, and they'll go, okay, this person got a 5.5. This person couldn't be bothered and got like a 2.5. We'll go for the person who got the 5.5. Now, what do you say? That's what I say to them. My thoughts are like 99% the same that I tell them to do AWA at the end. Uh, yeah. And so, honestly speaking, AWA isn't very tough. Uh, if you compare it with the verbal section or the con section, because there's no rush in terms of time. You have half an hour for the argument essay and the half an hour for the issue essay. But a 3.5 out of a 6 is a red flag. 3.5 or less than that. Mm. Definitely that is a red flag. So I, I also tell them not to prioritize AWA in the beginning. But definitely when a couple of weeks are left from your exam, they should see sample essays. Uh, that people have uploaded and I have also uploaded my uh, essays. One thing that I want to tell you here is that in my experience, I have felt that ETS marks you on three things, which is grammar, uh, spelling mistakes, and paragraphing. I'll also give you another insight that for every four spelling mistakes, ETS 
deducts around 0 0.5 on your exam. And that also includes typos in there as yeah. well. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what I say in my videos and the importance of proofreading. Because what a lot of students do is, even though they know how to spell some of these words, as you say, typos, they rush to the end, like, oh, I've got to get to the end. And then they run out of time and then they don't they have don't time to look it. back. And so I say those last three, four, five minutes to spare, where you look back over and check for all those errors, they can boost your score one point, two points. You know, it, it's a big deal. That's what I say as well. That's a very valid point. I also say that in the last five minutes, you should recheck. And also what I do is that whenever you've written a couple of paragraphs, I write the conclusion beforehand. Yeah. Okay. As so yeah. this is a, and, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah. ETS, yeah. It is does not give you marks for the introductory paragraph because everyone does that, mm. but it is does give you marks for the conclusion. So I tell them to write the conclusion and then fill up and uh, backtrack. That's easy. That's smart. I yeah, and that. that's smart. And then uh, they won't get penalized because for conclusion, if, if the conclusion is missing, they will definitely get punished. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I, I might start. I might start advising that. One thing I was going to ask you in terms of the the essays. Actually, before we move on, the um, so for the GMAT, I don't know how much experience you've got with the GMAT. Do you choose that? Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. I haven't tutored as such, to be very honest, but I know the entire exam, the data submission and everything, and that it is question adaptive and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just quickly for those students, like it's weird, like 90% of my audience is for GRE, even though I started off as a GMAT tutor and then I did GRE. But just for those few students who are interested in, in GMAT, the integrated reasoning should be even lower in the priority. <laughs> everything that we've just said about AWA, like one yeah. layer below that is integrated reasoning. And just to answer, like, I've got this like a thousand times uh, as, a, as a tutor. Like, I've probably worked with about 2,000 students, but this is, I'm talking in the last 10 years. You've been talking in the last year. That's the difference between us. So I get the question all the time. Oh, well, why do they have the integrated reasoning in GMAT if it doesn't count towards the score? And the only answer I can come up with is that I think they're beta testing questions for this other exam. I don't know if you've heard of it, the executive assessment. It's for people doing executive MBAs, and that does have an integrated reasoning section. And I think they're using GMAT students as guinea pigs to test out questions, and then they're going to feed those legit questions to that exam. So honestly, I think the only reason the integrated reasoning section is there is, is like unpaid guinea pig work. Now, I'm not saying to students, don't bother, like skip the section, just guess every question. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it should be even lower in your priorities than AWA. And that makes a lot of sense also because you can choose the order in which you can attempt yes. the matter. So yes. this is also a very valid point. Another question that my audience will definitely ask me for GMAT, and I'm not an expert in that, so I would definitely throw it your way, that what resources would you recommend for the GMAT? A oh, great question. So the difference with the GMAT and the GRE is that the GMAT official guides are actually really good. No offense, ETS, but like the GMAT official guides, they have three books. They're a bit more pricey, but combined, there's like 2,500 questions or something like that for the three books. And they're all official, legit questions. And in fact, when you buy the books, you get a code at the front of the book, which you can open up and then do the questions in an online format. And the reason I think that's better is that you can grade those questions by easy, medium, and hard. Whereas obviously when you're reading the book, uh, unlike in the ETS, the ETS, the official book, in fairness, it does say easy, medium, and hard, but the GMAT official book doesn't say easy, medium, and hard. The online version does. But to cut a long story short, the GMAT official guides, the bundle of three, they are actually really quite good. And for most students, I would say anyone aiming for up to a 700, that should be enough. Now, obviously, if you're aiming for a really high score, you might want to supplement that with um, some Kaplan resources. I think Kaplan is a great is a great provider. It's a bit more pricey for the GMAT. I think it's like $199, and you get eight practice tests and um, an online quiz bank. But for most students, to cut a long story short, the official guide 2022, which is really weird because you get the, 20, the 2022 version in like June of 2021. It's weird. So like in June of this year, the 2023 version will be out. So anyway, what, the point is, get the official guides. And this brings me uh, to another question. 
that MBA.com uh, uh, gives the uh, mocks, uh, the official mocks of the GMAT. How do you compare that with the real GMAT? So I think much more accurate, much more accurate. There isn't this divergent, divergence with ETS being easier than the real thing. I don't think that same divergence has happened with the GMAT. I think it's much more similar. Also, there's just a fundamental difference in the tests in that you don't have that vocab emphasis in the GMAT. So it's not like you're having to guess, oh, well, how will they structure the test this year? What words will they use? The GMAT kind of stayed more similar. And so I think the six tests from the MBA.com are really good to go. Now, one thing I actually leading on from that is that I always think practice tests are one of the best things you can do. And so I often talk about on my channel, try to get in minimum of six. Like some students of mine go into the real test with only like one practice test, minimum of six, but ideally between like 12 to 20 practice tests. Now, I mean, I'm interested, how many do you recommend to your students? That's a very good question. Uh, people ask me how many, first of all, they ask me what resources can be used for the practices. I only suggest ATS to be honest. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Power Prep 1 and Power Prep 2 are free. So everyone has access to them. Then some people don't know that the official guide has two paper-based tests. Uh, yes. Like 40% of my audience doesn't know that. Yeah. So those are, I know they are on the, older format in terms of marking yes. and the time, but still that's good practice. And then there are three power prep plus tests, which are $40 each. Usually students don't want to spend on all three tests. So if they ask me that, for example, they have, uh, they can only purchase one power prep plus, then I advise them power prep plus three. But if they yeah. want to purchase two of them, then power prep plus one and then power prep plus three. Those yeah. are the two most accurate. And then yeah. of course, if they have $120, uh, then they can purchase all three. But uh, still, I get the questions that we've done all these mocks. Can can you please advise some other mocks? I I I hesitate on that. I am I I am a strong ETS supporter in the sense <laughs> that the mocks can't be replicated. I I don't endorse them in the sense because um, their official guys are very less, which is very sad for students. Also, like yeah. they don't have enough uh, practice especially to real GI stuff, but their mocks are definitely way better than any other resource that I have seen. If you want to individually practice quant and time them, and like if, if you are still adamant, then no, I want to use other resources. I would say for verbal, Princeton is, is decent, not like very good, mm. it's decent. And for quant, uh, Mabush and Kaplan both. Okay. That's really interesting. That's a, that, that is a slight difference between us. That, um, although it also depends on budget priorities as well. A lot of my students come to me and say, I don't care how much it costs. You know, just, just tell me anything I can get to, to improve, right? And so if I was speaking to someone where, you know, $100 makes a big deal, I, I wouldn't, I would say, stick to the official, maximize, I'd say, watch all my videos, watch all SARS videos, you know, like get all the free resources. <laughs> But, you know, maybe don't spend so much on other stuff. But for those students, because almost all my students are in higher income brackets, you know, and so which is where, by the way, like my channel, I feel like it's giving back because all the time I'm working with these rich professionals. And obviously, you know, <laughs> that's helping rich people, which I, I love to do. But then, like, I want to give out to free videos for the poor people out there. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But, uh, uh, I have been lot of free YouTube videos of like at least 100 channels and your videos made a lot of sense to me because they were very easy to grasp also. Yeah. So uh, not uh, like I don't know you personally, but definitely, Philip, you're, you're doing a very good job. Uh, so keep at it. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, so going back to our, our point of difference, though, for those students, I think that, and I always put the disclaimer that these other practice tests, once you've run out, are not going to be as good as the real thing. They're not going to be as good as ETS. But I say to them, look, if you've got the time and the money to spend on them, I actually think it's useful to do those additional Kaplan tests. And that's where it's interesting. So I don't know who's right. Some would say that you're right because you're only giving students like the real stuff. Like it's all ETS, it's phrased in the same way. You're making sure your students keep to the official stuff and it's real. Some people would say I'm right because I'm pushing for more practice tests 
And the more practice tests someone takes, even if they're not quite as good, the more stamina they build, the more experience under time con conditions that they are. So I don't know who's right, but that's maybe a difference of emphasis between us. Yeah, that, that's true. Cool. Like, uh, we can leave this to the audience to decide. <laughs> and also, uh, uh, you know about the EDS GRE Big Book, right? Which one? Uh, the, the, the book of practice questions. Uh, the Big Book, which has 27 tests. Uh, mm -hmm. People don't know about it. And no, that is a gold resource. So that is a gold resource, Philip, that I basically scored 170 from 138 in the verbal section. So this book has, had been uh, published in the 1990s, even before that. Yeah, a lot of people don't know about this. Uh, What's it called? So I, it's called the ETS GRE Big Book. I made a whole video on it and it got very quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people have taken advantage of, of it. I'll definitely send you the PDF if you want. And Philip, so over there, you can practice seven text completion questions. Uh, so there are two, 77, so there are 54 sections. So get, so you can practice seven text completion questions um, uh, and you can multiply that by 54. So that is a lot of practice. Didn't the okay. test change though? The uh, so th this is a very good question also that the test changed, but especially questions six and seven of the big book, uh, that is exactly like uh, the real GRE single blank. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, and it is, it is the official, these are the official questions. Like, um, and people don't know about it. And I have definitely seen ETS also changing just the name and throwing it on the real GRE. So <laughs> that is the <laughs> That's, you've done your detective work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So because we're Asians, right? And Asians want, they, they can practice as much as they want, but they also want smart work and shortcuts. So Big Book is defi was definitely a game changer for me for verbal and also uh, for data interpretation, question 21 to 25. Yeah. Uh, definitely do those on the con section of those 27 tests. They will definitely help you. Okay, how about, how about we, we can agree to this, that I will check out that book because that sounds really, really good. Um, all those free resources. I'm a little bit scared about some of the questions not being useful, but if you could link in like which questions to focus on, which sections to focus on are useful. Definitely. I do think you might want to check out some of the latest stuff because some of these companies have evolved and they know the real test. Like they've got feedback, like Kaplan has got feedback over the years. I'm not, I'm not sponsored by any of these people. I used to work, I used to work briefly for Magoosh, but I'm not sponsored by, by any of these people. And they have looked at the real questions that have come up in the test and they have evolved their questions to try and get as close and close as possible. And I do think that maybe five years ago, you know, or 10 years ago, that the, the, the Kaplan, Manhattan, whatever, were like just almost useless because it's like so different from the real thing. Now it's a lot closer. So we can have a different emphasis, but that's, that's really interesting. You've taught me a lot there about the big book. Yeah. yeah I, I understand where you're coming from that if I use the, the old resources, will it be relevant to the real GI? I get what you're trying yeah. to say, but uh, trust me on this. Uh, for I'll, I'll definitely pinpoint the questions which you should attempt. That is what I tell my audience also. And I've also made a video on it, but I can definitely pinpoint the questions for you that you can attempt. Yeah, it. yeah, I might link that video in my description. And is it a PDF? Is it a PDF, this big book, or is it a, you have to buy it? Uh, you can get bo both of these. So I, I so this is a very funny thing that when uh, the big book, I, I didn't make the video. It was, I think, for around 20, 30 to 35 dollars on Amazon. But now it the price has risen. I'm not saying it's only because of me. Of course, other people would know about it. But uh, you can still get it on Amazon and I can give you the PDF for free. Uh, yeah. uh, people don't have access to it because it had been dis it had been disclosed. Because yeah. this was when the GI was out of 100, 800. Yeah. Okay, so I can put, I'll right. put a link to the in the description to the Amazon thing. The PDF thing is probably one of those like illegal copies, which is, you know, I'm sure people are going <laughs> to use that. That's fine. But like, I can't, I'm not going to endorse that. But okay, I, I will put that, I'll put that link in. That's really, really interesting. I, I've, I've learned a lot from you. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm still so impressed. Um, and just I, adding another thing. Uh, sorry to cut you, uh, for reading comprehension, that is the gold standard. And I have literally seen those passages, those type of things coming in the exam. Definitely for reading comprehension, 
it is so good i can't tell you i when i give you the access to it you will be amazed and uh, yeah. and the best thing about big book is that it has a lot of official material because at the end of the day ets made that also yeah so definitely uh, we yeah. should capitalize on that's a really good point yeah because reading comp isn't going to change much that's that's a really good yeah. point coming to an end just to, to learn about you as a as a person are you thinking of so you're mainly on instagram yeah. Um, how do you get all those students, by the way? So you just advertise in, in Pakistan? So that <laughs> so for, when I scored a 339, things blew up in my country because uh, a, a lot of people don't score this much. And because I spoke the truth that I had scored a 296 and then I scored a 339, people could relate with me that he's also a normal human being. He's not a genius or something like that. Mm. Or, which I think you are because you have cracked a lot of Yes. So, uh, uh, how do I get students? I think it is word of mouth, and I have been consistent for the past two years now. And I don't, I, I have never promoted stuff because uh, I am, th- I'm grateful to God that I get students through my Instagram DMs. But I would say it's through, it's some of them, uh, is through YouTube because YouTube recommends them my videos. Although I am not very active on YouTube, my last video was like. 14 months back, mm. but uh, the when they come, the, I always ask them how they know, uh, how they knew about me. Some say YouTube, and the majority says word of mouth. But uh, I and if the promotion doesn't work, uh, so I'll also give you another tip. If you promote on Instagram, it will only work within the country, and I I am very famous within the country. Within I say, I say, because I only it have. Work for you as, yeah, yeah you I only can. have people have advised me to like do. LinkedIn, uh, do TikTok, do so many things. Like the only reason I don't haven't yet done all that is because I get enough students from my channel and from word of mouth that like I'm kind of full. Like <laughs> it wouldn't be full for you. Yeah. Like it's empty for you, but like for me, full. And so I don't I need more students. But yeah, that's interesting. I, I will think about Instagram. Would you recommend Instagram as like? A useful way so to promote. Instagram is a bad option. It's better than Facebook, to be honest. And people yeah. see the following, just like uh, the YouTube subscribers, and it, it's it's easier to message there, to converse there, as compared to Facebook Messenger. That's yeah. what I have seen. And uh, I was saying that I get that you also do not want uh, too much on your plate for now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, well, I don't mind getting getting a bigger profile, you know, to help promote the channel and such. But I, I always associated Instagram with like people posting selfies, not like GRE. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people come to me and say that you're using Instagram for the right reasons. So <laughs> you get that right because people are just posting. I don't know yeah. what kind of stuff on Instagram, yeah. but uh, as they say, that there's always a starting point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, yeah I, I I feel like we should definitely stay in touch because you've got a lot to teach me about, you know, expanding uh, and that kind of thing. For sure. And uh, TikTok, I have never uh, explored that market. Uh, yeah. I mean, we can do something about that. Like, you can talk about it. I can also talk about it. Yeah, I mean, a student TikTok. of mine told me I should go on TikTok because it's like exploding at the moment for, for education. It's already exploded for entertainment. But apparently people are starting to use it for one minute clips to teach maths and English. So I might try it out. Uh, no promises, but I might try it out and get back to you. Yeah, I like people think people always wish that we're on more platforms, but they also need to know that it takes a lot of effort. Like it's a full time yeah. job doing YouTube yeah. stuff and managing your Instagram page and stuff yeah. like that. Especially when you have a huge subscribers like yours or a huge following like mine, it, it gets it gets tough. So you work, you must work with all those students, what, uh, 40 hours a week? 50? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, 45 to 50. Wow, that's, that's impressive. Yeah, I, that, and I, I have the entire Asian market, like I have people from India, from Pakistan, from Nepal, from Bangladesh, from Sri Lanka, and from China, but, uh, and Latin America also, so from Mexico. Mm-hmm. But I, I have taught around... Um, I would say around only 35 to 40 students from UK and like 50 to 60 students from the US. That's still quite a decent amount. You mean this year or you mean over your last few years? No, no, no. Uh, this year. This year? That's a lot. Yeah. 
if I compare it to the Asians, it's nothing. And you charge everyone the same amount? Uh, no. So for Asians, because the purchasing power is also less, so it's lesser. But yeah. for so it's basically yeah, it depends on the purchasing power. So I always my operations. I have two operations managers who ask all these details first and then give them their. Oh, so you price. have employees to help you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because no, I don't have that. because Philip, you will at some point you will have to schedule, um, and the problem will be that. There will be so much influx that you won't be able to uh, schedule without the help of someone. So yeah. I would say definitely get an attorney. Those are also cheaper on the pocket for you and they do good work and they would definitely want your channel's experience. And that's the same case with me. Yeah, you're right. A lot of the hours during my week, like I work probably 20 hours a week, but some of those hours that get added on are like me WhatsApping people and emailing people and organizing yeah. stuff and then people cancel and then I have to reorganize. So yeah, if I could hire I someone. I would say definitely don't do that. And yeah. it's, it's bad on your mental health and it'll get toxic for you at some point in time. Yeah. Yeah, I need to hire someone. Maybe, yeah, pay them like one pound an hour. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Philip, uh, you might be surprised but a lot of students would be willing to volunteer. Yeah. Mate, well, really someone, volunteer? Yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. Yeah, people have people have also volunteered for me. They they want to help when you are being genuine. Like I saw your videos, your intention was also to help. Yeah. People do help, especially students. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm yeah. If anyone watching wants to volunteer, I, I, you know, you can message me. Um, but anyway, I've learned so much, and and thank you for for giving up your time to speak to me. Same way. Likewise, um, uh, Philip. I think we should definitely have these sessions every now and then so yeah. my, my audience can also learn from you and your yeah. audience can also learn. Yeah. because uh, you are a 340 i think right yeah and a 5.5 yeah. AWA, which is huge oh I mean, oh you're you reminding say, me of my weakness how dare you <laughs> how dare you <laughs> yeah and uh, i saw your video which you said that i had a 5.5 but like i you wanted a six there yeah. When I did this, when I did the GMAT, I got a six in the essay, and then but when I did the GRE, I only got a five point five. Oh, okay. what's also annoying? You talk about annoying stu um, stories. Twice I got an eight hundred in a practice test for the GMAT, which is the perfect score. Twice, and then the real thing, seven eighty. I was I was so annoyed. No, Philip. So this I have the inside. They don't they don't give eight hundred out. You reckon? Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, I have talked to, uh, there's a guy, I, his name is something Singh. He has also aced the GMAT. I think Chindimber Singh or something on LinkedIn. Uh, he, they, people call him CJ. And they don't uh, hand out 800. They, they won't do it. Wow. So if you're thinking, I think 780, even 780 I haven't heard from someone. So you should be proud of yourself. Man. Thank you. Thank you. And on that note, I will see you soon again. Yeah, it was lovely speaking to you. Same.